Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great. Welcome back, everyone. So I'm not talking to myself, so I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I feel very stupid. Uh, let's get down to brass tacks with step 12. Um, ooh. Step 12, I think, is a way of life. It's not something I do on the side. My job is today, I'm a servant of God, a servant of the higher power. And that's not special. I think that's what we're all called to do. And it's the first nine steps which put us in that position when we can do that. Um, what I've had to learn to be is completely indifferent as to uh, precisely what God wants me to do. So, I, as I say, I do have a, I do have a, a couple of jobs, a couple of occupations, um, and I have uh, lots of uh, AA stuff that I do. But my period of obligation during the day, I get into the office at quarter to seven in the morning, and I leave anywhere between six and uh, quarter to seven in the evening. And during those 12 hours, I sometimes visit an AA group, attend an AA group. Uh, I will take sponsee calls. I'll do any admin uh, administration to do with any service that I do in AA. I might speak at a meeting. Uh, I do my day job number one i do my day job number two but it's all the same to me i don't care i I ask god what shall i do today and i do the things that i'm asked to do and i don't know whether this is right or wrong but I, i i don't know how to live other than to do that when i try to construct my life on purpose and say well i shall do this many hours of this and this many hours of that i get into emotional psychological spiritual trouble I've got to give the whole thing to the higher power. Well, by the way, as I said before, if a few more screens could come on, that would be lovely. So I can see who I'm see who I'm talking to. There you go. Eileen and 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 there's Spina and Carol. Lovely, lovely, lovely little faces, lovely little recovering faces everywhere. That's better. There we go. Um so I, I don't care. It, it all works itself out. Brother, Brother Lawrence, Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence is a wonderful read. If you haven't come across it, it's open source. It's the translations you can you can get, you know, from anywhere. Although if you get a good translation, it helps. So a modern translation will make it much easier to read than some of the old fashioned ones. So if you find a translation is from french 17th century french if you find the translation tricky look for a different one because there are ones which are much more readable but he was uh, a monk who essentially devoted each task to god so when he was called upon to do some very difficult work which he was ill suited to he did it cheerfully and gladly for the higher power when he was asked to mend sandals, to pick up a leaf of grass from the ground. He did it. He treated everything as service for God. So I don't care. Occasionally I do things which are a little bit, shall we say, secret squirrel. And uh, I, I could be flattered by what I'm doing, but I deliberately refuse to let myself be flattered by what I'm doing. Uh, if I'm doing something very mundane, if I'm doing the dishes, I treat doing the dishes as exactly the same as doing the potentially flattering task. Uh, I don't care. It's all the same to me. If it's not all the same, I'm in trouble. And as the, oh, so practicing the presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Someone asked what the name was, it, and it's Lawrence with a W. Um, I think you'll struggle if you look for it with the U. So Brother Lawrence with a W. Um, and as it turns out, uh, particularly I, now, a, a little bit about my my AA history. So I was, uh, f- for the first few years, very, very strong, first five, six years, very strong in AA. I started to drift between five and seven. I was out at eight, uh, not drinking, but out of AA. I'd visit occasionally, put my head round the door, uh, aerial bomb share, and then leave again. 
Um, and then I came back uh, around, uh, the, uh, there was a spate when I was living in Germany when I was around nine years. And I came back at nine and a half years um, with real vigor as I had to, to stay alive. I realized I was in terrible trouble. I'd drink if I didn't carry on uh, with AA. And I got back into it very seriously. Uh, I became very service and sponsorship oriented for about five years, but I missed the spiritual part of the program. Uh, there was no uh, there was no relationship with God. As a friend of mine describes it, it was like uh, the relationship between Washington and Moscow around 1980, 1981. There was a hotline, but there were no cordial communications between the two sides. There was there was a, a the, 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 there were notifications on a need-to-know basis only. I did not have a living relationship with a higher power. I had an abstract, bloodless notion uh, of a higher power, which I'd got from a tradition which is uh, not a... Well, I won't say which... But but I I couldn't bear the idea of a personal God. I just didn't like it. And if you can get by without one, good luck. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Uh, I don't know how you do it. and. I need an incredibly personal God. I need a God that I can, in my mind, physically lean on and sit with. Maybe that's due to the poverty of my imagination, that I need a God which is almost human in form, but divine in origin. I need someone I can talk to. I can't I can't bear the I can't deal with the idea of a sort of a, an abstract God. Um, uh, I think it's not by accident that in a lot of spiritual traditions. Uh, there isn't some sort of intermediary between God as the origin and the bit that you communicate with my local. I live in a part of London which is, it's all sorts of things, but it's there is a large Turkish community, there's a Kurdish community, uh, there are lots of Vietnamese, uh, lots of wonderful Vietnamese restaurants, and they all have these little shrines to their ancestors, because it's something which is tangible and visible, and they can communicate through that. Um, I don't know much about Hinduism, but I understand it's similar in Hinduism that the mystics will say that all is one. But for practical purposes, people need something that they can see and touch. If you look at the Catholic tradition, it's very physical. The sacraments are very physical actions. Why? Because my, my imagination is poor. I need something I can grab hold of. And so I have a higher power I can talk to. I'm, I'm going to go into details about it because it's not really the right place. You have to find your own way of construing it. But I have a place I can go in my mind, in my imagination, where I can hang out with my higher power, like with a friend. Um, and say, boy, am I pleased to see you. Because I'm sick of them whoever they are so there's nothing wrong i i'm always at home with my higher power i don't know how to do it without that i really don't and that's where i belong with the higher power and i'm here on a mission and the mission is not grand it's to do what's in front of me but i'll tell you what forms my step 12 has taken over the years so um i sponsor uh, a number of people uh more than I'm entirely comfortable with, more than I feel I can cope with, but apparently it works. So I deal with it. When I wake up in the morning, uh, there are several screens of WhatsApp messages waiting and the emails are pinging. And there's a, there's a it's like a complex game of whack-a-mole in the, in the morning, having to reply to everyone before the next onslaught comes in. Uh, I love it. If, I, if, if you don't love it, you're doing something wrong. Uh, sponsees are human beings. Let me just remind everyone of this. They're actual people. <laughs> so if you find them difficult, you have a problem not with sponsees, you have a problem with people. You've got a people problem. You're the problem. Now, it takes a while. Uh, I threw a lot of uh, 
uh, behaviors. I think sociologists refer to them as behaviors. I exhibited a lot of behaviors with sponsors over the years, and they had tactics to deal with them and learn how to manage the behaviors. Uh, and, uh, and as a sponsor, you need to learn how to handle an awful lot of very strange ways of interacting. And it's not anyone's fault. It's just that's just where people are right now. But it can be learned. And I have to say right now, I have a lot of sponsees. I'm, I, 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 I like all of them. I actually like all of them. How about that? I actually, not only, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I don't like everyone in AA, but I love them. I don't know what that means. I really don't. It's also a little bit patronizing. I don't like the other idea of people not liking me, but loving me. You can keep your love to yourself. <laughs> go, and, go and give it to someone else. I just, uh, so, but I like, I, I, all of them I like speaking to because I found a way of speaking to anyone in AA in a way that I enjoy and I can engage with my full self. I don't have to hold myself back. There are ways of talking to anyone. You just have to open up to the higher power to be guided as to how that happens. So sponsorship. Uh, a lot of sponsorship. Um there have been people I've sponsored over the years. Well, I don't think I've sponsored them at all. I'm the sponsor in name only. And I'm much quicker at catching that now because it does people no good to think they have a sponsor when they don't. If, if I'm not in communication with my sponsor, then I'm not being sponsored. It's an activity, not a static status. Like, na like you know, the way nationality is a static status. You don't have to do anything to be of a nation it's just something that you technically are and sponsorship is not like that it's a relationship which must be dynamic and there must be something has to be going on um it's not like a backup internet connection that it's nice to have it just in case the main connection goes down it's a, it has to be a real living thing um sponsorship the second thing is uh to be involved in the organization and running and maintenance of groups and meetings and events and that kind of thing and what i've done over the years has changed since the the whole uh phenomenon of that which shall not be mentioned over the last three years uh it's opened up all sorts of opportunities to run workshops and meetings so i do a lot less conventional stuff but a lot of time goes in every week uh on the organizational and administrative side of stuff on zoom on whatsapp uh i uh, uh i think those are the two those are the two things actually that i spend most of the time doing <laughs> but i'm always involved uh, in helping create spaces in which people can discuss recovery mm. um i attend two face-to-face meetings every week it's actually maybe going up to four i never know because I, I i i don't really plan my life i just say to god what shall i do today i found myself going to four face-to-face -face meetings uh every week all local within walking distance um and i'm not engaged in the running of those but i the two that i attend every week i attend every week and i go for fellowship afterwards which i enjoy uh, don pritz would say that the fellowship after the meeting is the real meeting that's where the business gets done the technical meeting which is you know the the, the, the meeting of the home group is is like a formality that has to be gotten through so you can get to the diner afterwards and then the real stuff that's where that's when you really get it out uh <laughs> um so there's that as for the meetings i go to uh i i go to a 7 a.m meeting every morning uh which is a 20 minute meditation meeting based on the big book and an assortment an array of various other readings of spiritual content not necessarily of spiritual origin i mean we've had quotations from house of cards on there um and, and and all sorts of all sorts of things sometimes spiritual writers in the traditional sense but it can be anything it can be joan crawford it can be the golden girls if it has content it has content god isn't too fussy apparently god seems powerful and intelligent god is above of above average intelligence i'm told god is able to speak through anything it's only people that limit 
what they think God can do. So we do that for 20 minutes every morning and we get around uh, 90 people at the moment every day. 7 a.m., not bad. Um, uh, and I go to at least one other meeting a day. And this does not sit, this going to a meeting every day plus the morning meeting does not compromise my ability to get the other stuff done because uh, there are three parameters of su success in life. Uh, two of them come from um, the Bill W's uh, essays on the concepts. The third notion come is, is spread all through the literature. Uh, the two parameters in the concepts essays are effectiveness and efficiency. Mm -hmm. Effectiveness is getting the job done. May not be elegant. It may not be efficient, but by God, it's done. Efficient, efficiency is about using the resources available in the best possible way, applying the resources in such a way that you get maximum bang for your buck, that minimum energy is dissipated in the process, that every conversation, um, uh, you're getting an awful lot out of even very, very short conversations. It's amazing how much work you can get done with a sponsee in 30 seconds, mm -hmm. in two minutes, in seven minutes. Um, uh, I used to see professionals where there was a 50 minute hour and it lasted 50 minutes, regardless of whether anything was being achieved. And uh, someone once told me about a particular French psychoanalyst. I think he was a psychoanalyst. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> Where the uh, the sessions would often last five minutes, ten minutes, and when he was done, he was done. Sometimes you make a point, and for the point not to be lost, you have to get off the phone immediately, or it's lost in a whole load of other crap. Efficiency is as important as effectiveness. Um. The third one is harmony. So you want to get the job done effectively and efficiently and in such a way that you are still walking straight at the end of the conversation, and so are they. Um, there was a fashion for a while in AA for saying, I care more about whether you live or die than about your feelings. And I kind of know what people mean. When push comes to shove, you have to tell the truth and be a little bit difficult at times. But it's not a virtue. Hurting people is not a virtue. And people being upset, having their noses put out of joint, is an extremely regrettable and occasionally necessary side effect of, in the same way that some, when someone's limb is, when a bone is dislocated, the operation, the, the, the procedure to restore the bone to its socket is painful but it needs to be done. And occasionally, I've had the most almighty slap from, not physically, but from a sponsor, um, a psychological slap from something they've said. And it was absolutely the right thing. And but, but it's a regrettable cost of a necessary procedure. It's not something to make a personality out of. And so I try, although I have to be brisk, I try and be, and I'm I'm not by any means, if you want a nice sponsor, I'm not, there are, I'll give you a list of people. I'm not the nicest person in the world, but I'm better than I was. I'm politer than I was, which may surprise people that know me. My, Jesus, what must he have been like 10 years ago? Well, you, I'll give you a list of people to ask about that. But the aim, the, the aim that I'm working towards is being someone that people don't have to steal themselves too much to call. I'm gradually working towards that. <laughs> let, let time be the judge of whether or not that works. But effectiveness, efficiency, and harmony. And uh, sometimes people say, I sponsor people exactly the way I was sponsored. So we read the book word by word. And if, you've, if you're retired and you have loads of time and not many people are asking you to sponsor them, maybe you've got time to do that. I think I'm probably more useful not doing that, finding other ways of getting the job done with a larger number of people. And people can work with each other. I can send sponsees off in little huddles to read to each other, to run through questions, to run through inventory. I am not supposed to be, a sponsor is not supposed to be anyone's messiah or friend 
or parent or catch all or a fact general fact totem or right hand man or anything i'm there to do a specific job and i think it's right for people to form a reliance on the higher power working through a whole array of people so that if one person falls out of the system for whatever reason they are still safe they are kept if one um little fabric rips in a safety net the safety net is still fine you don't want to be hanging from aa through the one thread of your sponsor because if something happens to that thread you are screwed because no one else knows you and, and no one else has the history now it's important i think it's important to have a sponsor and my a sponsor is someone who i give the authority to to override my best thinking when they think i'm in serious danger of doing something which will jeopardize someone else's welfare or my own so pick carefully um and i've never come a cropper by following the well the by, by following the sincere advice of a well-intentioned sponsor now there are exceptions to that in the world of 12-step recovery and i've come across them i won't rehearse them here occasionally people follow exceptionally bad advice and there are consequences from that that's never been the case for me but it's partly because i've been very careful who i choose to sponsor me and they're people who themselves are sponsored are part of a wide network of people it's the network which keeps me safe it's not the individual relationship it's the network i can be remind i can be told i am off track by any one of half a dozen people who have no compunction in telling me i'm being a jerk so this this wide dispersal of reliance keeps me safe and it also keeps my sponsees safe from me because if i'm off track they'll know that i'm not giving them the best advice because they'll get widespread support and redirection from elsewhere um people regret sometimes losing sponsees i think it's the best thing in the world that people go on to something which is the next stage of their development i'm not meant to be a lifelong uh, resource for anyone although i've known people in recovery for getting on for 30 years and i've sponsored some people for a very long time but it's not it's not a virtue or a merit in itself uh sometimes your job is to look after someone for two weeks or the shortest sponsorship i ever experienced i think it was 90 seconds I asked them a question. They refused to answer the question. I said, you'll need to answer the question. It was something like, where do you live? Or are you currently working? They found this very intrusive. And that was the end of it. But I think a lesson was learned on both sides. Lesson done, next. He may, that gentleman in question may have needed to have that experience with 12 people to discover that maybe he needed to ad adjust his approach and reveal a little more information. Please help me. I will tell nothing about myself, but please help me. No, no, it doesn't work. So you don't know what your job is with people. You, you take the work that comes when it's finished, it's finished. Sponsorship home group um service structure so uh now this is something that i've been encouraged to do by various people in service in great britain is to take breaks from general service otherwise you become the resident expert sighing in region meetings or in the in great britain we have intergroups and regions and other places you have areas and districts but the, the idea is the same it's an inverted triangle an inverted pyramid uh i i was going to i was on the, the board of uh london region and then london region north in various capacities with little breaks lots of different i would rotate out of a role but then rotate into another one for about 20 years 
and I became someone who was one of the resident concepts monitors. So whenever there was a concepts breach, me and a couple of other people, the, you know, the great big sigh would happen and everyone would look to us for well, what, what's happened here. And, and it doesn't do any good after a while. I, you need to back out of it if you've been somewhere for too long, but it does need to be done. So pretty much every job in AA, I've done it. I've been a, 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 a GSR. I've been the secretary of an intergroup, the chair. I've, I've acted as chair. Was I a chair? Yes, I have been the chair of an intergroup. Um, I've done various public information roles. I've spoken at treatment centers. Um, I've been a 12th stepper. I'm still a 12th stepper. So I take 12th step calls with real life, actual drunks. Very interesting. <laughs> They wrong foot you far more readily than seasoned AAs. They're the trickiest, the most surprising people to deal with, and also in some ways the easiest people to deal with. The hardest people to try and 12 step are people who've been in AA for 30 years but are screwed. That's hard because you've got, I'll tell you a story. I did, um, like a good Al Anon, many years ago, I did a, a St. John's ambulance course to learn how to give first aid. Of course, I've forgotten all about it. Because, of course, if I don't, who will? I need to know how to do this. Anyway, what they told us was about how to deal with burns. I was very badly burnt as a child. And so it's something I'm, I'm very aware of. Um, uh, and what they said was in emergency rooms, in the UK, accidents and emergency. Uh, when they deal with people with burns, most of the time, people have tried to deal with the burn themselves with various ointments and salves and creams and uh, uh, bandages and wrappings and all sorts of things. And before they can treat the burn, they have to get rid of all of the all of these oily. Because the oil actually retains the heat. It's the worst thing you can do to a burn is to put oil on it. Uh, it's ice, but ice is what you want. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's not medical advice. See a doctor if you're affected by any of the issues raised in this session. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't try any of this at home, kids. But anyway, what they said, that this is relevant. What they said was uh, they have to get all of the gunk off the burn. If you've ever been burned, you'll know how painful a burn is. And you, do you know how they get the gunk off? They have to use a spatula to to what I know it to wipe the stuff off. This is what and dealing with someone who is 10, 20, 30 years sober in AA, who's never done the steps properly or did them properly a long time ago, but has gone way off track. There's so much gunk you have to remove before you get to the person behind it. At least with someone who's never been to AA, there's no gunk. You just go straight on. Well, there are exceptions. If they've been very theropt, there can, there can be a lot to work through there. You have to get past the language. People have often learn to language, which you have to navigate past to get to the person. But anyway, so there's, there's working with people who are completely new to the world of recovery. The best ones are people where you say, have you ever been in treatment? No. Have you ever been in detox? No, I just threw up on my bed for six days. Fine, good. Have you ever been in therapy? No. Have you ever been analysed? No. Do you have any religious background? No. Simplest person to deal with. There's no gunk to get off. It's just a fresh person who is suffering. Um, so I've done a fair amount of that over the years. I've uh, I wasn't when I was very new in AA as a 21 year old. I was a, a terrible 12 step. It was like you have no credibility with people who've been drinking for longer than you've been alive. Now I'm older, <laughs> mercifully, there's a little bit more credibility there. Um, so 12 step work, um, all this, the other stuff I've done in the service structure. Uh, and I'm not saying this, none of this is bragging. Uh, it, it's simply to indicate what work is available to be done and must be done by someone. Why not you? Why not me? It doesn't matter. And you get good at it by doing it badly for long enough that you get good at it. And then you have to rotate out. Uh, I've also done a lot of armed services liaison. So as the armed services liaison officer um, for London Region North, I was also on the National Subcommittee for Armed Services Liaison. And I tell you, you think you've got problems. And then you encounter people in the armed services who've been on a couple of tours to Afghanistan, have uh, genuine complex PTSD, 
uh, someone touches them in a queue and they freak out and they're gone for eight to 10 minutes and who knows what they're going to do when they're gone. Extraordinarily difficult cases where they've been, where at the age of 16, 17, they join the armed services, they come out 10 years later with no experience of living, they've been in a structured environment. Incredibly difficult to have alcoholism on top of all of that and to, to keep all that stuff separate. And there are lots of professionals in Great Britain who, uh, whose job it is to help serving persons and veterans in various types of trouble. And there are millions of veterans in Great Britain, um, many millions in, in America, I'm sure. And uh, there is a lot of work, but there's definitely a role for AA to play. And there's definitely a role. A lot of the work with outside agencies is explaining AA to outside agencies so they can correctly identify who might be signposted towards AA and how to do it. And I was given the opportunity. I've, had, I've done lots and lots of things, particularly at national level. Uh, one of them was uh, a campaign of uh, posters and leaflets and information which was put up in all of the living quarters of uh, um, service serving persons throughout the whole country in Great Britain. Uh, another thing, there, there, there are daily orders which go out to people in the armed services, and there was a, a little, little insert in one of those that people had to read as part of their date following their daily orders. There's no choice about this, <laughs> uh, which is a little snippet about AA and alcoholism. Um, and we as a team made this happen. It doesn't happen by itself. Um, what else? I remember I did a, a presentation to uh, maybe 100 uh, professionals uh, covering the whole of the south of England from uh, Cornwall all the way up to Norfolk um, for armed services health. Uh, England is divided into three sections, so it's one third of the country. And um, the, the, there was a PowerPoint deck, which I produced for this. And uh, I saw the distribution list and the deck went out to 2000 professionals whose job it is to help serving persons and veterans. And when you think you've, carried, you've been, had the opportunity to carry the message to that many people who, uh, another one, um, talking to a team of psychiatrists in London whose primary responsibility was towards veterans and to spend half an hour overturning and reversing all sorts of misconceptions about AA. They came to the meeting with a huge amount of uh, quite understandable, frankly, prejudice and uh, misunderstanding and hostility towards AA because of some bad experiences, which I understand why people will have bad experience, why professionals will have bad experiences of AA sometimes. Um, my job was to go in there, not in a combative sense, but in a cooperative sense, to understand where they were coming from. And chapter seven is brilliant on this, about the aim is to look at the situation from their point of view, ask yourself, if I was in their position, uh, how could how could this material be presented in a way that would hit home? I've had the same talking to teams of military doctors uh, 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 and general practitioners who are practitioners to uh, serving persons and their families and getting them to relate their experiences. Oh, I sent a patient to AA and they attended for six months, but it didn't work. And getting behind that when your patient attended AA, what did that mean? Well, they just, they went to meetings. Do you know, did they get a sponsor? Did they do the steps? Did they get in? The... No. Oh, well, okay. So here is another way to look at this. This is what AA can offer. And, you know, the meetings will not get you sober. Uh, it is the program which will keep people sober long-term. The meetings are a vehicle for that. And seeing the doctors get it for the first time that AA is a lot more than meetings. And thinking this information can help that doctor help people for the rest of their career. That is a huge impact and a single AA member can have. And all you have to do is 
know about your own experience of AA, your own experience of your home group, and have a little bit of nous about how to present material to outside agencies, a little bit of, we're not professionals, but a little bit of professionalism doesn't hurt in those settings. Um, uh, so you've got really four forms of doing service. There's carrying the message directly through sponsorship. Not everything which is called sponsorship is sponsorship and not everything which isn't called sponsorship isn't sponsorship there are there's lots of sponsorship that happens where no one calls the person a sponsor mm -hmm. but the person is effectively in a position of of granted authority to guide the person share experience and perform minor corrections of perception <laughs> on key matters um and so you can be sponsoring people without realizing you're sponsoring them just because you're talking to them, you're sharing experience and you are a trusted person. It's often true of people who are young in AA, early 20s. It's difficult to find sponsees, but it's not difficult to find people to talk to and to share experience with. And I remember my friend Melody uh, many, many years ago, uh, she was in her 20s. Uh, she was uh, she was 26 or 27. She, she, she'd managed at the age of 21 to find a, a Texan oil billionaire to marry and, and caused all sorts of havoc. She was marvelous. She made jewelry. And uh, she was, we, we, we got annoyed with her because she never seemed to have time for us, but she was always surrounded by newcomers. She always had a clutch of four or five of them. They used to rove around as a gang. The, Identity of the newcomers would change a little bit over time because they come and go a lot, um, but some stick. And she made it a mission. She wants to help as many people as possible, to be there for as many people as possible. And whenever you saw her, she was surrounded by newcomers. Uh, there's a, there was a chap in, in AA in the West Country called Chris, who's decades, decades sober, doesn't believe in God, talks very openly about the fact he doesn't believe in God, but according to my friend James, whenever you see him, he has a, a car full of people with wild eyes. Um, he's always taking newcomers to meetings, taking newcomers from meetings, taking them home, talking to them about the AA program in simple, basic, practical terms. If that's not doing God's work, I don't know what is. When I look at those two people at both ends, Melody, who was just a few months sober, young, mad as a box of frogs surrounded by newcomers when i look at at uh, uh, chris at the other end of the scale surrounded by new people i think anyone can do it it's a matter of being aligned inside with the higher power to say i want nothing more but this i'm going to do just this if you happen to want me to have a day job give me a day job to do as a way to demonstrate to other people that the program works but the real secret mission is being a secret agent for god on earth to be a channel through which god transforms other people's lives and enables them not to die of alcoholism i've, I've been asked to speak at something later on this year and they said pick it pick an interesting topic and my heart sank a little bit i don't know what's interesting and i thought a bit naughty of me i suggested the topic how about this how not to die of alcoholism how's that for a topic because i think that's what this is about one can forget that this is about not dying of a fatal illness which could result in your esophagus hemorrhaging your internal organs literally dissolving it this does terrible things to people the fact i'm not dead is enough i don't care about the promises i've got the prom the promises have come alive in my life but i don't care it's great but i don't care what matters is that i get to not die of alcoholism one day at a time and i get to help other people not die of alcoholism one day at a time if that's not enough i don't know what to i don't know what to say i can't you can't sell this you can't sell this to people so my number one priority is to be of maximum service the reason i share at meetings a lot if i'm at a meeting i volunteer to share if there is opportunity to volunteer to share and i get in there i get in there quickly because my life is on the line it's not because i like the sound of my own voice my life is on the line my life depends on having the high octane 
fuel from the higher power. And I get that by being by fitting myself to be a maximum service. That's it. So these four methods of service, number one, sponsorship, number two, home group, number three, structure of the fellowship that you're in, number four, carrying the message to the outside world. And I don't know how it's possible for me to have done those things and hold down a job or two. And I've been married for 18 years. God help the poor man. But we've been married for, uh, well, we've been together for 18 years, married for a few. We got married on on, on May the 4th. I think that was a, 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 a Star Wars thing. May the 4th be with you. Um, uh, I don't know how it's possible to do all these things, but I can report that it is possible because I set that as my objective. I, I, I'm, they, they talk about, uh, I think the Jesuits say, the Jesuits used to say this, and it's, it can sound rather sinister in the wrong hands. They, they would say, if, if you, if you uh, entrust a kid to the Jesuits at the age of seven for religious instruction, there'll be, God willing, uh, loyalty towards the Jesuits for the rest of the person's life. And now I know that one can go south occasionally, but the principle is the same, I think, with AA. AA got me very young, and I recognize I, I, I wouldn't be alive if it weren't for AA. So I belong to the higher power. It is not my life anymore. And what I get back, there's the story about someone wanting to turn their will and life over to a higher power. And they say to God, okay, I, I, I want you to save me from my alcoholism. And God says, uh, I want your career. And so I have to give up my career. Absolutely. I'm going to take your career and your car keys and your house keys and your wife and your kids and your hobbies and your Gucci this and your Gucci that, everything. I want all of it. So, okay. And the person that says, okay, God then says, you can have all of these back but they're entrusted to you to be a good custodian of these, but these belong to me now. And that's old, old Serena from Camden Hill. She had this great, she was, there are lots of people, and I got so lots of people who looked like royalty, but weren't, and they sounded like royalty. And Serena had this great aureole of hair. It was extraordinary. It, it was like one of those sort of Elizabethan ruffs. It filled the room. And Serena said, my life is mortgaged to AA. And that's absolutely right. And I don't, collect, I don't care if that's not politically correct to say that in some way. Maybe one shouldn't say that, but it's true for me. And the truth is that I get an extraordinary life in return for this. And I'm, as I say, said earlier, for people that missed it, I was mentally ill when I got to AA in addition to al alcoholism. I was antisocial. I was incapable of anything. So the whole thing is a gift. Some practical things on step 10 and step 11. So let's get down to some basics here. Um, step 11 in the morning, um, Brendan in East London talks about uh, uh, Brendan is tough. Brendan is half German and half Cockney. If that doesn't make you tough, it's almost as tough as French Canadian. Uh, not quite, almost. And uh, he would say, first thing in the morning, you need to get a preemptive strike in against the devil by saying, God, please direct my thinking. Uh, and then next, please divorce my thinking from, from uh, uh, self-seeking, self-pity and dishonest motives. And when I say that, it is like my limbs are being cut off. My left limb, my left arm, self-pity. My right arm, self-seeking, dishonesty. My legs, there's nothing left. What else are you going to do except serve God after that point? Uh, so, the, so the first thing I do is I scuttle myself first thing in the morning and say, I, my little, I wake up sometimes with this idea that uh, I need to get out there and live my life. No, 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 no. Uh, I give my life to God in the morning. So what do you want me to do today? I just need to be a faithful servant. And the step 11 in the morning, there's, there's, it, I, I think maybe it's almost a mistake that the word meditation was used in the big book. I think if a different 
word or different phraseology had been used, there'd be far less trouble with the word meditation. If you said meditation, the word meditation to 100 people in the contemporary world and say, what does it make you think of? Draw a picture of what you think meditation is. You'd be miles away from the 1930s definition of the term. Uh, and dictionaries vary, but essentially the idea is this, is concentrated, directed thought. It's not about becoming mindless. It's not even about becoming mindful. It's so someone just posted a little picture of someone meditating. Exactly, that's the point. Now, there's nothing wrong with meditation techniques of this religion or that religion. Certainly all religions have their meditative practices. But AAs is a very simple idea. It's how can I bring the knowledge of God's will for me to bear on the tasks of today. It's, there's nothing in the early literature about it being to achieve altered states of consciousness. So in step 11, when it says knowledge of God's will and the power to carry that out, that's enough. I heard someone say at a meeting many years ago, poor old chap, I shouldn't laugh really, but it was funny. He said, I can't meditate. I've got restless leg syndrome. But he had the idea that to meditate, you had to sit on a cushion in a particular pose for 20 minutes. Of course, you don't. You can walk to the bus stop and think about God. God is available on the walk to the bus stop, at the bus stop, on the bus. God is in Tesco's. That's a supermarket. If you're in Texas, it's ancient was it H and H and B? Well, I can't remember what these supermarkets are called in America. H E B. Um, if you're in New York, it's Stop and Shop. God is in Stop and Shop. <laughs> if you're in Massachusetts, it's Market Basket. God is there too. Not sure about Hannaford's; it's a bit too pricey. But the New Englanders will get that. But God is everywhere. I don't need to do anything special. I don't need to light a Yankee candle. If you want to light a Yankee candle, you get to light your Yankee candle. But I can I can talk to God and I do talk to God anywhere. It's about the quality of the conversation, not the beauty of the surroundings. It's like when you talk to your best friend, you don't give a you don't give a I almost said a bad word. You don't give a bad word about the surroundings. You just want them. You just want your friend. To me, the relationship, the higher power is like that. I say to God, what do you want me to do? What attitude should I take to this situation? How should I look at this? Bottom of page 87, right thought, right action. The only things I'm interested in, the right thought and the right action. And prayer and meditation are the means to get that. Prayer is asking. To me, meditation is listening. How do you listen? You listen. And uh, so you ask God, how shall I look at this situation? And then watch what thoughts occur to you spontaneously. How do you know they're from God? You don't. There we go. You don't know for certain. What you can do is, as Bob Olson says, you trust that if you sincerely want to seek God's will, your hit rate of receiving God's will for how you should look at a situation, how you should act in a situation, your hit rate will go up by virtue of your sincerity of seeking. So I've got a, a whole load of people on step four. It's like a production line at the moment. Um, uh, and I've observed the most extraordinary thing with, with a number of people recently where they were blocked and the inventory was being done, but it didn't feel like it was entirely honest. It was entirely clear. It was, it felt like it, if it, it felt like pushing treacle through a, a keyhole or something, you can get a little bit through, but really you're not getting the, the job done. And with each of them, there was a sudden shift and the inventory that was coming out there was 10 times as much of it. It was clear. The corrective measures were insightful. The depth of honesty was extraordinary. They happened on the, the click happened on the inside because the people became honestly willing to search out every last corner of what is going on inside them. And, and that what comes with the desire for honesty is that creates space which sucks in knowledge from higher realms. I don't know how that 
happens, but honesty creates a space. And into the space comes knowledge of God's will for how I should see a situation and what I should do in the situation. And it's a transformation. A miracle is a transformation which breaks the rules of time and space where something is achieved in a relationship between two people. And this is why sponsorship is the catalyst for miracles, where it's just like in snakes and ladders. When you hit on the right square and vroom, you go up a ladder. And you, it would have taken you weeks of moving your little counter to get there. But suddenly you hit the right, and the right square is the square of willingness. So you, the difference between this and the game of snakes and ladders is you get to choose where the ladders are by abasing yourself completely, saying, I'm screwed, I'm effed, I don't know, just show me. I don't care what my life is. I don't care where you take me, but just take me somewhere better than this. Let me see what I am doing wrong. If the problem is out there, it will never be solved. If the problem is in here, there is hope. Show me what needs to be changed in my beliefs, thinking, and behavior. And as I said earlier, brace yourself. <laughs> Sit down <laughs> just in case, but you'll be shown Step 11 at night uh, or at the end of the day. If you're Jewish, the day ends at sundown. Not a bad idea to treat the beginning of the day as being just after sundown, the end of the day being sundown. You try and do, I don't know about any of you, when I try and do a serious inventory at 11 o'clock at night, good luck. No. I don't want to be churning my mind up with all that crap at 11 o'clock at night. Where, by the way, people sometimes wonder what, why the step 11 in the big book starts off with the nighttime review at the end of the day and then goes to them. You'd think it makes more sense to do the, um, the morning first and then the nighttime afterwards, the planning and then the debrief. And it's because in one of the earlier drafts, the daily review is done in the morning. Suddenly it's a nighttime review. I don't know why. I can't remember why. But that's that's so there's no obligation. It's that this is about the spirit, not the letter. If you can do a great inventory at night, good luck to you. I'm not going to stop you. If you struggle to have clarity and it just churns you up and it's horrible to go to bed, or it's horrible to go to bed on an inventory horrible so i do it towards the end of the day usually when i'm walking back from work i run through the day in my mind so what went well what went badly and if anything rankles with me i call people and just get it processed out of the system so i can go into the evening clean and maybe pick a couple of corrective measures for the next day maybe one corrective measure for the next day if i concentrate on one thing for a month, I'm much more likely to succeed than concentrating on 15 corrective measures a day, then nothing gets achieved. Step 10 in the big book is simply being aware of what is happening in real time and adjusting the steering wheel as you go. Uh, step 10 and 11, I treat with a very light touch. I don't turn them into heavy projects in and of themselves they are there to provide me with strength and direction to do the next right thing and i'm really not so very important uh working out what to do should not be a herculean task on a daily basis it should be simple and clear and it can take a while to get the hang of it but that is it i needn't get ideas above my station what, God, what do you want me to do today? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say to whom? Give me a correction, corrective measure. And I tell you, if the corrective measure was, if, you, if, if the record got stuck and your corrective measure forever were being patient, tolerant, kind, and loving, you would be 99% of the way there. God's will is not a mystery that has to be cracked out of a Chinese puzzle. <laughs> Patient, tolerant, kind, and loving. And I'm working towards these <laughs> objectives. Finally, I'm working towards these objectives. So I keep it very simple, really, at the end of the day. Um, uh, we've got a few minutes less left. Let's see if we have any questions. If you can keep the questions brisk and brief, I think that would help us all. Uh, it's been a long day. 
uh, and I'm about to lose my mind. So, <laughs> so, so if you have any questions, put your little yellow hands up or whatever color your hands are, and hmm? Simpsons. Simpsons hands. I've been told. There we go. There we go. So put your hands up, and we'll see if there are any questions. So, so Quentin. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you could uh, give us some uh, keywords on uh, the relationship with God to tell us more. Sorry, what do you mean keywords on the relationship with God? Well, because you said to keep it short. Yes. But, okay. okay, tell me a little more though. I, I haven't got the sense of the question. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to hear more about the relationship with God from like, Uh, the practical aspect of it to what to do, what not to do, that sort of thing? It's a good question, and it's a question to which I have no answer. Other than this, it is constantly changing. It's con The way I access the higher power It's a sometimes I think God is a bit like the Borg in Star Trek, where whatever you fire at the Borg, it adapts. So you have to keep your phases on rotating frequencies for the phases to continue working. If you don't know anything about Star Trek, ask a male between 45 and 55 and you'll get a clear answer, probably. Uh, so find out about the Borg afterwards. Uh, but God is like that. It seems that sometimes people do the same thing every day for years. I don't. I went through a phase for about five weeks when I listened to a whole Joyce Myers uh, uh, video for about half an hour every morning. And then I got indigestion from it. Now I listen. I just turn on radio through classical music station and I listen to that. I listen for God through the music and I find God through that. And that will stop. And then I'll do something else. And then I'll do something else. Sometimes I read a gazillion spiritual books. Sometimes I can't read anything and trying to get something spiritual, some spiritual reading in my mouth. It's like when you're trying to feed a baby that doesn't want to be fed. Don Coyes, um, uh, uh, he, he wrote a wonderful book about meditations for uh, Native Americans in recovery. Uh, and he talks in there about there being seasons, spiritual seasons. And there are seasons when I'm in winter, where all my leaves have fallen off and everything is dead and cold. And God is simply a blanket of snow around me. There are other times when I'm growing. The th God is not tame. So once I think one simply surrenders oneself to the practice of trying to seek God and then That's how the questions are answered, but it can't be put in a box. People say my higher power, and I understand why people say that. But I heard someone said, say, well, my, my program, my meetings, my big book, my higher power, like there are a series of little dollies, which are the things that your little helpers. And it's not I those things don't belong to me. I belong to them. I don't take the program and apply it to my problems. I take my mess of problems and bring it to the program. Um, so it's a lifelong thing. And after, you know, 30 years of doing this, this business, it's, it's over 30 years since I first went to AA, just over 29 and a half years. Uh, I feel as I barely scratched the surface. And you read Thomas Merton. And he says a similar thing. He, said, he was um, um, meditated as a, as a Trappist monk, silent, wouldn't suit me, uh, for 16 years and came out, wrote a little poem, which essentially said, I don't know what God's will is, but I trust that my sincere desire to seek God's will is sufficient. God can work with that. Um, something, uh, um, so Don Coyis, C O Y H I S, C O Y H I S, very, very good stuff. Um, 
Tom W, Father Tom W is very, very good on all the good on all of the, the, the God stuff. Uh, but one thing I have to remember with God is that I am very, very small and stupid. And God is very, very big and clever. It is not a symmetrical relationship. Um, the spina, you had a question, then it went. Will it come back? Or you're trying to unmute. Josh, can you enable Despina to unmute? Yes, thank you. Yeah, well, I think you pretty much answered my question because I'm someone who has absolutely no idea what that means, God. And so I have grasped on to, um, you know, the group as my higher power, the meetings. But when once, So you had mentioned that you had no spiritual program until you did. And so I was curious to know when it was you realized the light come on in your heart. What is it that gave you the confidence that you had met your higher power? Because you certainly okay, so, seem to have a relationship. Yeah, I do. It's the most important relationship in my life by a long short, the relationship right. with the higher power. So, so when, for the people in the room, so when when and how did that come about? And and there is, yeah, I want to speak to that point. Um so having having the group as the higher power, uh I, it's not a bad start at all. But what changed it for me completely was recognizing is God, the higher power, is that which lies behind the group, and the group is the channel, not the source. So if the group went the higher power is still there and there would be another group this reduces the unhealthy reliance on 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 particular people particular places and particular personalities so there so the higher power there is a source somehow there is a channel there are means of accessing the higher power so in Christianity, they talk about the sacraments, which are means of activating this, this relationship. In AA, we have means of activating the relationship. Amends, uh, confession in step five, writing sordid little lists of things in step four. <laughs> We've got rather sort of base sacraments. But through some extraordinary alchemy, you get gold out of these. You get higher precious metals out of them. Um, it is the experience. What made the change for me is completing the last amend and getting to a point where there was no one in the world I felt I had harmed that I had not done my utmost to make amends to. And then I realized there was nothing wrong with me fundamentally. The ego had nothing to pin my sense of separation and sinfulness on. Gone. And you get that out of the way and the higher power shows up. If you want notions of God to look, to, to, to think of God as this, mis this mysterious thing which lies behind these channels, which extend all the way like tendrils into the material world. Uh, the uh, desert ascetics, A-S-C-E-T-I-C, -E the desert ascetics, the desert mystics, the, the, the early fathers of the Christian church are very interesting on forming a relationship with God and ideas about God. And um, I think it was Origen who had some kooky ideas. I'll let you find out about those in your own time. Um, but one of the, I think it was Origen who said, uh, God is that which takes the deadness away. I think that's very good. Um, Tom W tells a story. Uh, this is fourth hand, but no harm comes from that. Um, about a woman in AA in, I guess, the Bay Area in the 1970s, whose life got smaller and smaller and smaller until she was drinking on a green couch. And she just sat on the green couch watching daytime television, drinking. And she didn't have any notion of a higher power, but she had an AA group. And she went to AA, and a few months in, she was hoovering and she realized she hadn't sat in the green chair since she'd come to AA. And she realized her higher power 
is that which keeps her out of the green chair. And I, I don't think you can get better than that. God is that which keeps me out of the bottle shop. God is that which keeps my little feet walking along the street when my head wants to go into the pub. Um, in one last, one last story, and then I'll take one last question. Okay, so um, someone gave me a commentary on the discussion between Moses and the burning bush in the Bible. One knows the story. So Moses is moseying along, and he see in the desert, he sees a bush. The bush is on fire. He thinks there's a bush on fire, nothing of it. And then the bush talks. He hears a voice, and this gets his attention. And he says to the bush, who are you? Now, this is not pleasant cocktail hour chit chat, because in many early religions, the priests knew God's name. And if you knew God's name and you sacrificed a goat uh, or a something else or a someone else and threw it into a fiery pit and you invoked God's name, God would God would smite all the people you had a resentment against. That was how it worked. Sacrifice the right thing, invoke God's name. So when Moses said, who are you? He was trying to get control over God. And God's answer, very sneaky. God is of above average intelligence. Um, God issues the, the, the four letters of the Hebrew alphabet, yod heh vav heh four letters, um, which get translated in different ways one of the direct ways of translating it is i am who am in other words i am that which has always been i am that which will always be until the end of time in other words you don't get to know who i am but i'm here and i'm not going anywhere i was here first who are you very interesting. One of the brilliant informal translations of the tetragrammaton, it's called, the four letters which make up God's name, is no matter what you do, I will never let you go. No matter how far away from God I go, I don't have to trek all the way back. I don't have to backtrack all the way because God is there with me at all times. All I have to do is get on my knees spiritually and say, help me, help me. The best prayer in the world is help. Or if you're Penelope Pitstop, help. Help is sufficient as a prayer. Little more is needed. It's the sincerity which counts. There is a story about a kid in the forest, a Jewish story, uh, Poland, 17th century, 18th century, kid in a clearing in the forest um, reciting the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, blah, blah, blah. And a grown up you know, grown-ups who know things. Yeah. The grown-up said to the kid, what are you doing, you stupid child? <laughs> Why are you reciting the alphabet? The kid says, I'm praying. And the adult says, that's not a prayer, that's the alphabet. You're reciting the letters of the alphabet. And the, the kid says, yeah, but God knows how to assemble them in the right order. You don't have to get the prayer right. You don't have to get the program right. You just have to do it as best as you can. If you, the prodigal son story, when the prodigal son returns, the pro, and the, the, intra, the older brother is an al -Anon. the older brother has done everything right, has cleaned up the mess left by the kid, has done all the work that the kid should have been doing, and now he wants the reward. Martyr. The, you know, I, and I'm and I'm both sides. I'm an 
AA and I'm an Alamo. I'm a double loser, as they say, or is it double winner? One, one of the two. Um, but the prodigal son is on his way back and the father comes all of the way out to meet him. He's so excited that the kid is coming back. I think God is pretty excited when I turn a corner and say, I'm done. You have it your way. And in the big book, it says when we start to approach God, God comes all the way to us. In the book of James, it says exactly the same thing. So I don't need to figure anything out. I need to take some actions and then God will show up in extraordinary ways. One last question, Jojo. Hi, thank you so much. My name is Jojo, I follow the addict. I apologize not being there in person. I didn't realize you were physically here in Tucson. Otherwise, I would have made a point to get there. Um, but I've been checking in throughout the day, and I appreciate everything that you've shared. I have two questions. You can choose either one because I would like your suggestion on uh, your uh, suggestion on either one. Uh, my first sponsor, uh, when we went through the steps and finished, uh, she had stopped working with me because she said that her teacher had told her once we go through the steps, that's you, you have the same thing that I do. And so it was pointless for her to sponsor me anymore. I want to know your your take on something like that. And the second thing that I had was um, recently, like in the past week, I've had three previous sponsees who have come back in and they're asking me to sponsor them again. And we've already gone through the steps. I'm I, My sponsor says to do it, but I'm struggling with what what can I offer them this time around that's different. Yeah, brilliant question. So I'll just repeat the questions uh, for the room. There are some people sitting a long way back, so make sure that they, they, they can hear the questions too. Um, they're doing really what well. they've got like notebooks and pens and highlighters. It's amazing. Um, okay, so a couple of questions. Uh, is there any purpose in long-term sponsorship is really the first question. Once you've taken someone through the steps, is there any mileage in sponsorship? And secondly, can you take someone through again? Um, let's do the second one. Let's do the second one first. Uh, one of the things I said earlier, and I think it applies to this, is you wouldn't say, well, there's no point in me looking in the mirror again. I've looked in the mirror before. Uh, you're helping them. It's, we're not giving people information. We're showing them a method. And we're being the companion, but I don't take people through the steps. They go through the steps. I signpost what to do, and I'm the witness of the procedure. And I can provide some practical experience. Uh, uh, you see, they're a few years older, but I'm a few years older. And there is a, I, I've found it work extremely well. I've had lots of relationships with sponsees where I'm a sponsor for a while, then I don't see them for 10 years. And then they come back and then we do a load of work and then they disappear. And then a few years later, they come back and they go to someone else and then they come back to me. It's fine They're because there is always more. It, it, the program is not a static thing, which just happens once. The program has continued to evolve since 1939. In, in I don't know much about Islam, but there was a there's a notion called the, the gates of Ishtihad shutting, where at some point the body of knowledge about what is true Islam stopped. And uh, now, I'd, as I say, I, I don't know much about Islam, but that mustn't happen in AA. Uh, God will continue to reveal things through us. And I, th the hit rate of 50% success in the big book for people who really tried. I think it's up around 98, 99% now, because I just think we're better at doing this. We know more of the pitfalls than they knew. Half the people that um, uh, were in the first hundred drank again. So do you want to do exactly what the first hundred did? Which of the first hundred? Be careful which ones you're listening to. There was. It's an extraordinary book, but it is not the Bible. This is a dynamic experience. Secondly, and I think this is a very good point to, to finish on, and I'm going to go and lie in a darkened room for maybe two or three days. Um, if I'm not taking hiking, which would be a great thing as well. <laughs> just, um, but this question of long-term sponsorship, we lose as many people out the top of AA as out the bottom. 
uh, I know people that have gone down blind alleys of mindfulness, meditation, Course in Miracles, yoga, all sorts of things where these spiritual paths take the place of the nuts and bolts of trying to carry the message to someone that has recently puked on their shoes. Now, I, a friend of mine, I've got a friend I'm a bit worried about. Uh, not super worried because I have an Al-Anon program, but I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned from afar. I'm not interfering. I've offered opportunities, but I'm not interfering. He wrote a post on, on Facebook a while ago about how he thought this notion of sponsorship in AA was very inappropriate long term. And he used the line, because who knows me better than I do? And I thought, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. If you want to find out what I'm really like, ask my husband, ask the agencies I work with, ask my students. You'll get some of the truth from me, but boy, will you get more insights from them than I could muster. Um, my response to that idea, no one knows me better than me, is this. I think my friends have got a much clearer view of what the back of my head looks like than I do. I know what I look like from the front. They know what I look like from every other angle. Clancy tells a story about the invisible rowing boat where someone's drowning in the sea and these two guys come along floating just above the surface. So we have a treatment for alcoholism. And, and they say, what? You, crazy you're floating above the surface doing these weird movements and um, and they said get in and row and he says get in what the rowing boat there's no rowing boat just get in and row and he and he rows starts to row as he starts to row the oars appear and then the boat appears then it turns out this is a huge very powerful vessel but it won't appear that initially now, there's an addendum to the story. So AA looks like it won't work, but it does. Shouldn't work, but it does. But he says a very interesting thing. He says, after that, you occasionally say to people, you've got your awe upside down. And the purpose of sponsorship long term, I believe, I've had the same sponsor for, for 12 years or so. And uh, he knows me well, I think. And I disclose what is going on. If I'm in trouble, I tell him. If I'm upset, seriously upset, and I can't see the way through, I tell him. And I go and stay with him. I talk to him. Uh, I talk to him a lot. Uh, and I talk to him more than I talk to sponsees, sponsors, when I was in, in early AA, because the responsibilities in my life are so much greater. I need more powerful people watching my back than when I was new, when all I had to do was, was uh, you know, uh, carry casseroles from a kitchen to a hot plate and back again and, and not spit at the people in the canteen. That was, that was, that was the extent of my <laughs> responsibility. You don't need much guidance for that. But when you've got a bunch of sponsees, you're doing a load of service, when you're married, when you're looking after an elderly person, you've got a couple of jobs, you've got dozens of students, uh, you've got responsibilities there. And the Jesuits are a very good model for this. They understand that people continue to need supervision. A psychotherapists, uh, I understand from my psychotherapist friends, of whom I have a few, that you have to, you have to uh, continue being supervised. You're not let do those sorts of very important very personal tasks without having people watching your back. And I'll finish on this point. There's a wonderful image which works very well for this. It's, and I'm, I, I know nothing about botany, um, but uh, giant redwoods apparently grow in clumps. You, you don't get them on their own so much. And their roots intertwine very deep below the surface because they couldn't grow roots strong enough to keep them safe in winter storms on their own and i think it's like that in aa uh the people i see who are stable and happy 
and just regular folks doing the AA deal at 20, 30, 40 years sober, successfully not dying of alcoholism one day at a time, are the people that have around them a clump of giant redwoods who are looking out for them and for whom they look out. And sponsorship, I believe, is an integral part of that. They're not your boss, but they're your little Jiminy Cricket. <laughs> And maybe one day you'll become a real boy. That's all I've got. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Because as I say, it would have been dull. It would have been dull to do this just talking to a screen on my own. And uh, the recordings will go up on the first 164 Blogspot blog, uh, probably in a couple of days uh, at the most. So watch this space. There's also an event next weekend out of Galveston, Texas. So Central Time. That central time, so it's one hour ahead of mountain time for the Europeans who get very confused by all this sort of thing. We don't understand why you're not all on Greenwich Mean Time. Um, but the Galveston one, we've got a speaker on Friday evening with 65 years sober who's coming in over Zoom. We've got people live in Galveston, uh, five speakers on the, on the Saturday and then a panel on the Sunday. People with many decades of recovery, 50% AA, 50% Al-Anon. So there's something for everyone. Um, so that that's very exciting. The details of that are on the first 164 Blogspot blog. So uh, uh, that's what we've got. But that's all we've got. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And Josh, are you available to stay for a couple of minutes afterwards just to Absolutely. look after people? That's super. So I, I'm going to log off, everyone and uh, go and do something else but it's lovely to talk to you all and i hope to see some of you in real life soon so thank you very much thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed the podcast sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links thank you very much